All right, uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, we're, we're up and running. Um, so we're super excited to have uh, Todd Mostak and Alex, sorry, last name, David, David. All right, sit right there, sorry. Uh, from MapD, MapD is one of these, again, these newer startups that are designing data systems for, to run on GPUs. Uh, the background for Todd is actually quite interesting for this. So he was a master student at Harvard. Yeah. And he was doing research on the Arab Spring, and he wanted to do uh, visualization of the tweets. Went down the street uh, to MIT, took the database class there with Sam Madden, and then ended up building his own in-memory GPU database engine to do processing of the tweets and visualize them. Realized this was a good idea, and then lo and behold, <laughs> that he became a startup, right? YOLO. Yep. <laughs> that, uh, exactly. Time. Thanks. thanks, Andy. Yeah, hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for... Uh, sitting through the technical difficulties here. Really excited to be here, both Alex and I. Um, so I'm the CEO and co-founder of MapD, and uh, Alex is uh, one of our awesome engineers. Uh, coming out of grad school, he can tell you a little bit, out of Johns Hopkins. Initially working more on the graphics side, which I'll talk about, but um, basically across, across the stack of our system. So I'm gonna jump right in, because I know time is relatively limited, but um, so MapD, so MapD is, uh, we're not a mapping company. MapD originally stood for Massively Parallel Database. Um, sometimes it's confusing uh, for people, especially since we do do a lot of maps and geospatial, which you'll see. Um, we're not quite a conventional database in the sense that even though um, I think we, how do I say this? Uh, we focus on running SQL very, very fast by leveraging the massive parallelism of GPUs. Uh, we do a lot more than that, right? So we don't necessarily want to be a traditional data warehouse. We feel that the advantage of having all the speed is the interesting things that you can also do with GPUs. So you can leverage the rendering pipeline to visualize data in real time, as well as leverage the uh, the massive compute capabilities of GPUs to actually kind of embed uh, machine learning um, into the uh, into the platform, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So jumping right in, I seem to have lost my, uh, there we go, great. So why would you do something like this, right? So um, CPUs are ubiquitous, right? And you know they've evolved and they're everywhere. Uh, they work really well. Um, they still get faster every year, right? And it's it's relatively easier to program something on on CPUs, right, than it is GPUs. CPUs are truly general purpose processors, and there's a whole ecosystem. Not to mention, um, you know, a, a massive number of people who know to how to program to CPUs. So why would you actually try to run a database or an analytics platform on a GPU? So just starting at the like 10,000 feet view, right? So looking at it, basically organizations are drowning in data. So the amount of data being produced, and a lot of this is sensors and devices, IoT, it's also clickstream data, it's social media, um, call data records, um, you can imagine data coming off satellites. Essentially it's growing at a 40% year over year rate, right? But actually CPUs are only growing, their processing power is only growing at a 20% year over year rate, right? So every year, and this is probably a high, this is kind of a top of the line number. In many aspects it's uh, probably lower than that, and particularly with things like Meltdown and Spectre, um, you know, they may actually be going backwards, right? So <laughs> there's this gap here between the growth of data and the growth of CPU processing power, and it's causing people to take all sorts of awkward workarounds. People have to downsample, they have to pre-index, they have to pre-aggregate, or they just scale out, right? They throw massive amounts of hardware at it, but a lot of platforms simply don't scale very well, right? So you might double your servers, but you may not get double the performance. And not only that, but it costs a, it costs a huge amount of money, and there's a lot of complexity in managing massive clusters. So that's where GPUs come in, right? So I think hopefully uh, a lot of you are familiar with graphics processing units. Originally, you know, built to run video games, you know, people realized very early on that it was better to have many slow cores to render pixels, um, which is basically an embarrassingly parallel problem, uh, to a screen in parallel rather than having a single fast core render them sequentially, right? So this idea, so you know, people like NVIDIA and AMD, and there's a bunch of, uh, I think AMD bought ATI. Uh, a lot of folks were building technology around this, and then at some point people had this revelation that, hey, this actually parallel architecture is good not only for visualization or for rendering, uh, but also for a whole host of other tasks. And the cool thing about GPUs is, uh, I'm not gonna get into all the, all the reasons why, but because they have this different, almost simpler architecture, it's kind of just, brute force, let's throw thousands of cores at this thing. 
uh, thousands of ALUs. Um, they've seen, you know, they've, they've been able to scale, a performance scale in a way that CPUs haven't. So particularly over the last five or 10 years, every generation of basically NVIDIA's GPUs has been roughly, give or take, kind of 50% faster year over year. So the cool thing about this is that as, you know, CPUs show signs of actually slowing down, there's signs that we're kind of at the end of Moore's law, the traditional kind of doubling of uh, transistors every 18 to 24 months. Um, GPUs have this architecture where they've been able to scale, and then basically as Moore's law does give us more transistors, we're able to basically throw that into uh, to, to more cores on the GPU, and the performance gain has been pretty linear over time. I'm happy to talk about why that is, but yeah, okay. So I know Bill Valley loves this graph, but large chunks of that upper line are because of area growth, right? And if you look at what NVIDIA has done with the sort like they, they have produced the largest diet of the humankind in Volta. Yeah. They've taken, they've scaled that back for Turing because it's just too ridiculously expensive. There's no indication that they're going to be able to continue doing that. Right? <laughs> they've taken their one last advance to 12, TSMC 12. They're going to hop to TSMC 7, and they're as dead as Intel. So your, your, your assumption here is the just blatantly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, we've already got the 100X, right? The yeah. 100X is there, and it's probably not yeah. going to disappear. But the extrapolation is For extremely sure. speedy. There's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, that's a strong way to put the argument, right? There is, a, yes, on Volta, they went to the rectical size is massive. I agree, right? I don't know what tricks they have up their sleeve, and obviously, we're all bound by the same transistor sizes. I agree, and 7 is the next uh, next step. Um, I do think that there are certain things that as you get more transistors, um, they tend to scale better, right? Like CPUs are, have a multi-pronged problem, right? They're not just trying to do one thing. Like you, um, do you add more cash? Do you add more cores? Do you add better? It, I'm not denying it at all. Yeah. The gap is totally there. It's just the projection. So let's just block this out. <laughs> I, this is definitely, you know, I, I see your point, right? And I don't want to have a crystal ball. And I think, obviously, they went to the max for Volta. So, and I can't speak to the roadmap or anything they have on their sleeve. But OK, let's just say here, right, there are some signs that, and I think that a lot of it is just the kind of singular purpose of GPUs is just to do compute, parallel compute at scale, right? So a lot of the things with CPUs, you have these very fast cores. And what are you going to give your transistors to, right? So it's a choice, right? And they're not always just trying to optimize flops. They have other things in their mind, and there's a lot of cache synchronization that needs to happen, and yada, yada, yada. So there's some advantages in scaling for GPUs. Whether it will continue, I think um, it's a good point. So, um, But I do think there's a significant advantage here right now in 2018. So thank you. <laughs> Keep me honest here. So this is the most marketing slide we have, and so um, I'm sorry. <laughs> we hired a marketing team. This is what happens. Um, <laughs> so, you know, what's cool about GPUs, right? Um, I think there's three, three cool things. So everybody thinks of GPUs in terms of their compute, right? Like the teraflops, every one of uh, NVIDIA's recent GPUs has at least over 10 um, single precision teraflops and the double precision depends on the architecture. So that's exciting, right? Um, but there's also some very other cool things about GPUs that distinguish them. So high memory bandwidth. Right, so the ability to scan massive amounts of data. So the latest NVIDIA GPUs almost have a terabyte a second each of memory bandwidth, and you can combine that. You can go eight ways in a box, and all of a sudden you can scan a ton of data per second, right? So particularly in um, SQL or analytics workloads, which tend to be memory bound, frankly, right? I.O. memory bound. Um, being able to scan more data per second uh, is, a, is a huge win. So the second thing is the rendering pipeline, right? So this doesn't matter to a lot of people, but as you'll see for us, we actually are a very kind of vertically integrated stack. You can use us as a pure SQL database, and people do that. Um, you know, replace data warehouses in certain circumstances. But where I think we're really focused and where we shine is being able to use an integrated stack, where not only can you query billions of records in milliseconds, but you can actually uh, also render that in situ. You can visualize it at a granular scale. And then finally, and this is more a um, kind of future looking for us, obviously they have a massive amount of compute. So um, teraflops per card. And as you've seen, the whole AI revolution, at least the deep net revolution, has largely been built on, on GPUs. And so being able to leverage that and kind of adding it to your analytics workflow 
predicting nulls by running you know neural nets, being able to do even just logistic regressions or XG boosts, which tend to run faster on GPUs. Um, it fits nicely in with the uh, kind of analytics ecosystem that we work in. Cool. So just to give you a quick high level tour, and we're going to dive into some of this, and then Alex is actually going to get pretty deep into one particular um, aspect of the system we're focusing on around adding geospatial uh, types and execution capabilities to the system. So, you know, the core of our system is basically the SQL engine that runs on GPUs. And so basically it's a, um, you know, we have our own memory management. We do persist on disk, although we think of ourselves, we try to cache as much in memory as possible. And then we have an LLVM compiler execution engine that goes on top. So we actually generate, like a few other good systems out there, like MemSQL and, and uh, Impala, we actually generate code on the fly. And so that is uh, also open source. So we open sourced uh, about 18 months ago. Um, so it's Apache and everything. So you can check it out on, and I think Alex is gonna show some code samples. Um, so that is all open source and you can run it on eight GPUs, whatever, and you know, scale to billions of records. Uh, so that's, that's been very cool for us in terms of engaging the community. Then we have this render piece, right, which is actually one of the highlights of the system, and I think you'll see it in a second when I give a demo. But this actually uh, runs like, it's actually on the GPU, so the very cool thing is that um, there is CUDA, uh, CUDA is the kind of compute language for GPUs, and there's OpenGL, right, which is quickly, I think people are gonna be moving to Vulkan, but it's a graphics API. And what we can do is actually keep the data in memory, run a query, keep the results set in GPU memory, and then render in situ on top of it, right? So you can take billions of records and do scatter plots. A lot of geo stuff is one of the, the main use cases, but you could potentially do network graph layouts and all this kind of thing. And it's very nice because you don't actually have to ship data to the client. You don't even have to ship it off the PCI. It can all be done in situ. And then you'll see here we have Immerse, which is a visual analytics system, which is like a very lightweight kind of BI thing, but it was built kind of to work hand in glove with this whole stack. So we can leverage the rendering. Uh, it very efficiently leverages the query engine. And then it's just a, you know, it's a platform. So it's a database, so you can have JDBC, we have Kafka connectivity. I'll talk about Arrow in a little bit, which is something I think is really exciting, and, you know, and on the way out. So you can put it under Tableau, you can uh, use Arrow to feed it to say XGBoost running on the same GPU. Um, H2O has some really cool stuff that's open source that we can, we can leverage. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, this clicker is a little bit <laughs> bugging. So just quickly, I'm gonna to cut to a demo here just to give you a sense. I'm gonna, I know we're time bound, so I'm gonna do this very, uh, let's see. Okay, so just to give you a sense of the scale that the, the system can achieve, there's a boat here in the middle of the, uh, in the middle of Kansas or something. I don't know what that's about. So this is a, um, a demo we have. This is about almost 12 billion records. This is an open source data set from the US Coast Guard. Um, it's basically uh, ship trajectories, right? So all the uh, ship AIS data. And so this is an open data set that we actually just ingested into MapD. And because we're a scrappy startup, we're actually running this on, I think, 1080, 1080s? Not even 1080 TIs. So we're running this across 32. You could take a modern new Turing card uh, our new Volta, 32 gig Volta, and probably run this almost in one, one server, but we're running across four servers here. So you can see here that uh, this is Immerse, so it's hitting our query engine, which I'll talk about in a second. And everything here is interactive, right? So I can, um, you know, I can zoom, as I zoom into San Francisco, everything updates. And the thing you'll notice here is that all these charts are cross-filtered. So as I zoom in, it filters on all these other charts, the ship type, the ship length, the time. And the cool thing here is that obviously you don't want to send 11 billion records from your, uh, from your server to your client, right? We'd be sitting here all day. So we actually render that in situ and we're sending a compressed PNG back to the browser rather than actual um, all these data points. And so, you know, in some ways, like server-side rendering is not cool anymore. Everybody wants to use DECGL and KeplerGL. Um, but frankly, when you're doing kind of analysis at scale where you can't just move all this data to the browser, right? So I can start here and I can cross-filter this and you know, all of a sudden, I'm pulling an entirely different data set to the um, to the uh, to the browser. So let's see here. So as I zoom in, so we're sitting here in the Bay Area, right? And this system is a little bit sluggish. So you can try it on your own computers; it's quite fast. But um, let's do this. There we go. 
Okay. So now that I zoom into San Francisco here, so our office is sitting here, and we can actually see the boats. Uh, I think they're tankers, right? They sit out here and they moor, and you can actually see them um, basically uh, kind of move around in the tide as they're as they're mooring. And uh, if you look at actually what's happening behind the scenes here, so just to kind of give you a sense. So this is not a, um, so just showing the SQL, this is not really a product feature, right? But as I kind of brush here, you can see all these queries running. And the reason why we can be so fast and interactive is that we're basically table scanning this data. There's no pre-indexing, pre-computation, pre-aggregation. We're literally running these queries and, um, you know, as I zoom here, we're literally running these queries in, okay, 74 milliseconds, 33 milliseconds, 40, 66, 37. Um, and we can also do this render. So I'll talk a little bit how we use Vega, which is an open source kind of rendering API out of Jeff Heer's lab um, to run these uh, visualizations, these renderings on top of the data. So that's how we can be so fast and interactive. And all of these demos are online. So just feel free to go to our website if you're interested. Um, and you can check them out. So there's SQL happening under the hood, and in the non-demo stuff, there's interesting ways of being able to actually use SQL to interact with the system or something like Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Cool, okay. So this is, I'm gonna skip this demo because we're running a little short on time here. Let's see. Oops. That's, there we go. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to fly through this a little bit, but I think it's interesting to understand where uh, the space and where kind of GPUs have come from and how they've evolved in the compute engines and when and why people started thinking about actually running databases on, on GPUs as well. So just quickly, you know, um, back in the Wild West days, there was not even something like OpenGL, right? Every, every uh, vendor basically had their own API. Um, there was nothing portable between, uh, between the vendors. But people even early on, I mean, this is back in the um, back in the '80s. People were already starting to try to map compute. So the early pioneers or cowboys in this space would literally try to trick the GPU into saying, "Hey, I have all this data, and I want you to do these algorithms on it, but I'm going to trick you, make you think this is an image. I'll just load this data as texture data, and like you'll run it through the graphics pipeline. But something interesting will happen that I'll be able to use." And then OpenGL, DirectX hit, which were kind of standard APIs to do graphics. Um, uh, Brooke was Ian Buck's uh, work, who's the kind of father of CUDA out of Stanford. Um, it was one of the first kind of uh, C-like APIs, which CUDA evolved out of general purpose compute language, and then OpenCL, which is kind of the, the twin that AMD has really pushed. Open standard, but AMD has pushed. All right, I'm just going to stop using this. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so... So once we had this compute API, right, the space exploded in the sense that people said, hey, there's something different here. We have this new hardware paradigm with a ton of compute that we can leverage. And so people started doing kind of different things with it. So the first wave was all this kind of HPC and kind of scientific compute workloads. So this is whether it's protein folding or it's doing steady at home or it's uh, simulating nuclear weapons or whatever it is. People realize that GPUs are very good at um, a lot of Monte Carlo algorithms at running these algorithms. And then the next big wave, and this is why NVIDIA is no longer a sleepy company, but this company that's market cap is approaching Intel, is the whole deep learning revolution, right? So I think in the last five years, you've seen an explosion of people saying, hey, let's take neural nets, which is actually not a new idea. It's been around since the 50s almost. But all of a sudden, everybody had all this massive computer at their disposal, so you could do things. You could do deeper nets, you could do bigger nets. And all of a sudden, these deep nets were actually more effective than a lot of traditional machine learning algorithms at solving uh, particularly classification problems, but other things as well. And so that's created this huge industry, and I'm sure you, you hear about it all the time. And then finally, I think what's exciting is that there's been this um, emergence of general purpose analytics <laughs> databases and kind of visual analytics platforms, uh, which we're part of, right? And you've heard from uh, Connecticut, and I'm sure you'll hear from some of the other folks as well. And I think there could be potentially a big market there. So um, we're not the first to do this. So you know, well before MathD existed, um, there's papers of people trying to use the graphics API to shoehorn database operations into it. 
Um, Peter Bakum, um, he actually did uh, Virginian, and it was basically the first full SQL acceleration. He used SQLite as a plug and was able to take some of the op codes and actually run them on the GPU. Um, since 2012, so Matt D started in 2012 out of Sam Madden and Mike Stonebreaker's class, as Andy mentioned, um, and there's been an emergence of um, quite a few other academic platforms. And then you have commercial um, GPU databases. So we founded in 2014. You also have Kinetica and some of the other uh, some of the other companies that you're going to hear about in this seminar series. So I'm going to keep moving here. These are interesting questions about GPUs, but I just think uh, we just need to keep moving because of, I want to run short on time. I want to make sure Alex has time. So I'm just going to give a quick architectural tour, um, show you some of the interesting parts of the system. I already told you, you know, the core engine is this very fast SQL engine moving towards more of a general purpose compute engine. Like it shouldn't just be SQL that we're running, but imagine running, being able to run any kind of general purpose algorithm across multiple GPUs, multi nodes, and being able to leverage SQL as well. So you can think of the platform evolving almost towards something like Spark, but running on, on GPUs. And then it's very closely coupled with Mathy Immerse, which is what you saw there, um, hits the SQL engine, hits the render engine, and provides kind of a very fast interactive um, experience for data exploration. So Mathy Core. I'm going to just talk about a few things I think are interesting. So there's a lot of design considerations uh, that you have to think through when you're designing a GPU uh, database or a SQL engine. So the first thing is that the, the memory on these GPUs is relatively limited, right? Particularly when we started, um, when we started in MathD, I think the GPUs basically capped out about six gigabytes each. And you can maybe get four in a, in a server. So the first uh, server we bought at MIT back in 2012, I think it had um, you know, like 24 gigabytes of memory. So that's pretty paltry, right? Um, fast forward to today and, you know, these systems have evolved where now the, the cards, the standard cards have 32 gigabytes each. And there's actually a new card, a Turing card that has 48. So there's signs that it's going bigger. A lot of it's driven by wanting to put bigger uh, neural net models actually in memory. And so you have actually quite a bit of compute that you can leverage and, or sorry, quite a bit of memory you can leverage. So the idea behind MathD is we're a columnar database, right? We're a column store. You only pay for what you use. And so we'll actually cache the hot data in GPU memory itself. So that's kind of the L1 cache, if you will, just to use a metaphor here, where we keep the hot data here, what's being actively queried. And not everything actively queried needs to be on GPU. So the system will use CPU as well. Um, what doesn't fit there, we can spill into CPU RAM, which is the equivalent of our L2 cache, often much bigger, and the memory is much cheaper but it's also significantly slower. So on a GPU, you can have almost a terabyte a second of bandwidth. You can have eight of these on a, on a box, right? And CPU, you know, you might, this is probably a little outdated. So you might see 200 gigabytes a second across uh, dual socket. You can see higher on quad socket, but there is a big gap, order of magnitude at least gap, if not one and a half between what you see on GPU and CPU RAM in terms of bandwidth. And then finally, you have SSD. We persist on SSD. And so you can think of the whole system as this wedding cake architecture where we have dual buffer pools on GPU and CPU, and we try to keep the data that we need to on, uh, on in GPU RAM. Yes? What's your ratio in a typical deployment of these writes? Like, is this mostly static data? You're querying analytics, or are you ingesting a lot? Yeah, so that's a great. Repeat, repeat the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, his question was, um, what's your ratio of reads writes? Um, you know, are you frequently reading data? Is it static? Um, yes, <laughs> yes, and yes, in fact. So uh, we actually built the architecture with this kind of in mind, right? So the cool thing about MapD is particularly for a pen workloads, fast stream workloads, what we'll do is we'll keep the data in, in GPU memory, basically. And then, you know, as the stream comes in, it goes into CPU and we can move it to, to GPU. But we can actually, I, I guess you could say, um, we can stage it so that, you know, there's a delta, you run a query, right? And then a new query comes in and there's a delta of what's not been put in GPU memory. And so that's actually quite small, right? So it doesn't really um, affect the query query times, um, not in any significant, significant way. Now updates and deletes are a little more complicated. Um, we haven't overly optimized for that use case yet. We probably will do more. Um, but that is something that we do more kind of as a, as a batch thing that's, a, that's synchronous. Um, but you could do a lot of stuff to make that faster as well. Actually, streaming data is a frequent use case. I would say 50% of our customers, it's either streaming via Kafka or it's like micro batch every 10 seconds. And the nice thing is because we don't have to pre-index the data, we're, we actually can see very fast ingest rates. Um, we have an oil and gas customer that saw 
like 500 million rows in about 40 seconds, 50 seconds. And that's simply because we just take the data and columnar encode it and just, um, we do actually normally persist a disk, but there is a full and memory option as well. So I have a question on the caching. So, so is, it, um, is it basically that, what you're, since you have this large table, um, are you just sort of focused on what columns are currently, is that what makes it top, what columns are currently being queried? Exactly. So the system is not terribly smart right now, but it's basically an LRU system, right? Where it's whatever's been last touched, we could obviously get smarter about being predictive about patterns, query patterns. And then we actually do things where like a projection doesn't necessarily have to be in GPU. So if you're doing a select star, right, you're not doing any compute on that. So we'll actually run the filter, for example, on GPU and then join that to the projected columns on CPU. And we also have something called, uh, uh, what do we, like fragments, which are basically partitions. So we can do fragment or partition skipping. Um, what's the, there's a technical term for it in the database world. Uh, partition skipping? Yeah. <laughs> basically you use metadata, so we, we have metadata on each partition, right? So if you have a filter. Oh, zone maps. Yeah. yeah, yeah, zone maps. So basically, you know, if you have a where date is in the last one month and you have a year of data, right? And often your data is inserted in time order, or you started on it or whatever, we can skip things that, um, and that can increase performance a lot, or you know, you don't pay for that memory that you don't need. We can just skip it via so metadata. If I'm, so if I'm currently zoomed in to you know, San Francisco, then clearly like most of my data is, is filtered away, right? Can you take advantage of that? We, so right now, relatively little. It would depend on if you inserted your data in, or you sharded your data explicitly on kind of the geo dimension, yes. Um, if not, you're going to be scanning at least that filter column. Obviously, you wouldn't have to access in memory the other things, right? So if we fail the filter, then we'll just skip that. So you could you could achieve some memory bandwidth savings by being able to just say, hey, this predicate is false, so I don't need to access the, the memory of the other columns that would be in the query. Uh, however, we'd still have that in GP memory. You know, there's a lot of smarter things we'd like to do in the future. You can imagine seeing access patterns and say, hey, we're going to rearrange the table or actually do an in-memory kind of temporary view where a materialized view where we're actually have partitioned on this geo thing or time thing on the fly. Um, but currently it's, you know, um, the access or sorry, the insert pattern has to be, has to be right. Are like CPUs and GPUs just sort of like taking their different words or they're just like splitting word clips? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. So right now, um, the cool thing, and this actually ties into this, so we use LLVM as our compilation engine, right? So with some tweaks, we can basically take the, the same templates of code and generate them for x86 or for GPU or even things like power and ARM, right? So obviously we do some optimizations around GPU because not everything is the same, but a lot of the code can be reused. Right now, it's, um, we're working on this area. So right now, basically, we'll pick you know, if the data is too big, um, it will fail and run on, on CPU. So what we're working on now, um, actually for a um, fairly major retail customer, is this idea of, you know, they have like years of data, right? And they want to make sure that, you know, a certain amount of the data is kept in GPU memory and is ultra fast, but the rest are okay. Okay, these are porting queries. It's okay if they take 20 or 30 or 40x as long as the GPU queries. So the idea would be that you'd have a, a slow lane and a fast lane. And the fast lane is your GPU, and you can actually execute in parallel, right? So data <coughs> Initially, when it comes to like CPU, and it depends on like uh, so sometimes the rel goes to GPU. It's it's just done lazily. So when a query wants it on GPU, the executor will request it, and yeah, you know, the GPU buffer pool will request it from the if it doesn't have it, it'll request it from the CPU buffer pool. The CPU buffer pool doesn't have it, it'll request it from disk or storage, right? And so it's chained. And so then if you've cached it, then it'll just say, oh, I have it in cache, and then just give it back to the executor as a pointer. But you know, the goal is to be able to use these all the hardware efficiently and so that we can execute you know, across whatever hardware you have in, uh, in parallel, right? That's kind of a cool thing about GPUs as well, is that as we're doing, a lot of databases really suffer when you have heavy read analytics queries, because then all you're pegging all your cores, or you're using a lot of your cores, and then you're actually trying to do ingest, which may involve indexing, which we don't do, but we do th do things like dictionary encoding and things that are relatively compute intensive. So the fact that we can use GPU heavily for the read queries and the CPUs are relatively free for parsing CSV or Parquet or, or doing the uh, string dictionary encoding, this kind of stuff, it's really nice because it doesn't bottleneck the system. 
So anyway, compile queries with LLVM. I won't go into this. This is not a MathD specific thing, but I think um, it's a smart thing to do for an analytic database. It's essentially the difference between running an interpreter, like interpret language like Python, versus a compiled language like C or uh, C++. And the you know the great thing is that you can um, there's a lot of overhead in an interpreted base language um, or interpreted base uh, query engine, and that you do one operation on a on a on on data, it's like A times B, and then you have to materialize that some way. If you're really smart, maybe you can do it in cache, and then you add three to it, and you have to bring it back into memory. So we're basically when we can, we generate just one fuse function, right, using LLVM, and then it can just run and Sometimes you do have to materialize for joins and things like this, but generally it's much faster. Um, even on CPU, it gives us a good speed advantage against interpreted base query engines. So how do you generate the, the, do the code gen on the LVM stuff? Is it like C++ code generates the IR directly, or do you have like an intermediate language? So once we get our analyzer nodes, we basically, and Alex is probably a little closer to the metal uh, to this than me uh, lately, we basically, um, yeah, the C++ walks the analyzer nodes and generates LLVM IR directly. Okay. We've talked about an op code thing because there could be some advantages for um, you know, being able to cache. So we do cache compilations, but you can imagine if we had uh, op codes, we could be a little more sophisticated about that kind of thing and do some more optimizations that are tricky. And we could have a nice separation between, but We also yeah. have uh, a lot of uh, pre-rated C++ code that we compile okay. and then uh, we'll inline that where okay. appropriate. Yeah. So like all of our hash joint infrastructure, a lot of uh, runtime functions, we just write in C++ and uh, drop in a, a CUDA suffix and compile it in BCC. Yeah, when you have a known algorithm, there's really no, there's not really a big win of actually generating the code via LLVM, right? It's just complex, right? So when we have these kind of things that we just always do, like hash joints, um, we'll have, we'll just call inline, basically, the, the C++, which is cool. And also user-defined functions, right? Could be written in C++, and they're just inline into the LVM generator. Cool. How are we doing? Okay. Wow. All right. <laughs> if anybody has to go, you saw Immerse. It's cool. It's great. Um, just quickly on rendering. You know, we use something called Vega, which is out of Jeff Hears lab at um, at UW, and uh, we use that. It's a declarative API to show how to visualize data, and we use that on top of our SQL, so we can map things like uh, political party to color and things like this. And we generate these compressed PNGs rather than sending the raw data back to the browser. And the cool thing is, you probably saw in the ship demo when I was hovering, uh, it looked like the data was actually in the browser. Um, we do that because we also do this cool thing where we actually generate a hit map. Uh, we also render it through OpenGL. And we'll actually um, keep the ID, the row ID, of what element or what data item actually ended up on top so we can do quick reference. We can also do link list referencing. So if you actually want all the items, it's a little slower. Um, but you can actually see all the items under a pixel as well. Or that's actually being worked on, but it's about to question. about the way. Do you, yeah. do you see resource conflict between the rendering pipelines and the, and the CUDA pipelines? Yeah, so sometimes, right? So uh, right now, especially if we render in situ, right, you might have 8 or 16 or 32 GPUs, and you keep the data there, and then you render on top. So that will actually, we lock around that because it contends for resources with the CUDA pipe, right? So right now, yes. So one of the things we're working on is basically something that's out of band, where you might have separate GPUs responsible for rendering, particularly with systems like NVLink, which is this kind of fast interconnect between GPUs. You can imagine doing kind of this asynchronous pipeline. But um, not right now. So there is some contention sometimes. Usually the render, um, you know, it, the query might take 20 milliseconds, and the render might take anywhere from 10 to 30, depending on the complexity, right? So it, it can be some bottleneck. But the system is so fast that often it's really unnoticeable unless you have a lot of load on the, on the system. So I'm going to skip this, this GDF stuff. The only thing I'll say is that we're really excited about something called Apache Arrow. And we've been integrating it into our system. And so it's a native way of getting data in and out. Apache Arrow is just a um, common in-memory uh, column or data format and a set of APIs uh, driven by Wes McKinney, who's the Parquet. Um, he's the Parquet. He's Pandas guy. And uh, I think it's really exciting because what we worked on, we did this thing called the uh, GPU Open Analytics Initiative. Uh, last year, we founded it with H2O, Anaconda, and NVIDIA, and BlazingDB join, who you'll hear from as well, and Gunrock. And basically, it allows all these systems to talk together 
um, in memory um, using this columnar format. So you don't even have to send the data to CPU. So it makes it, it's interesting, it's almost like externalized UDFs where you can actually do compute on the uh, data, you run a query, you filter it down in MathD, and you can send it to like XGBoost and H2O and do it all in, in situ. It's still early, right, but we're working on a multi-GPU version of this, and I think there's a lot of exciting things in store. Okay, great. And now I'm going to turn it over to Alex. We need a mic. Oh, yeah. I know exactly. I was like, that was a little bit, uh, but you had your own mic, sorry. Oops. <clears throat> All right. Um, so I like it. Todd introduced earlier. Uh, my name's Alex, I'm a software engineer at MapD. I've been there for about a year and a half now. Um, and I, I thought it might be interesting to kind of uh, go through how we added these geospatial features to MapD. So about um, three months ago now, at the beginning of the summer, we launched our 4.0 version, which had geospatial capabilities. Um, and so I worked on this project pretty extensively. And uh, I might have a slightly ambitious agenda for how much time we have, but we'll see. Um, but the nice thing about the geospatial capabilities is they kind of give you a quick tour through our system. Uh, so I'm kind of going to start in the middle, um, there we go, with, uh, with our sort of cogen kernel execution. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how we handle query parsing, query optimization, and then at the end um, I'm going to actually talk about some ongoing work uh, that I was sort of working on on the plane last night. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have some time for questions and let you guys get out of here relatively on time. Okay. You mentioned all this is in the open source too. Yeah, yeah, I'll, um, that's a good point. I, so I have some call outs on the bottom of the slide. So uh, we have an open source repo that has our core database, um, which actually tracks our internal repo master branch with usually only a couple days or at most a week latency. Um, so uh, I've tried to put links to, to code and GitHub on slides and hopefully we can distribute the slides to after, um, after the talk. <clears throat> I'm going to go super fast because we don't have too much time, but please stop me for any questions. Um, so we, we started with uh, uh, this geospatial capability. We do a lot of mapping already or um, you know, rendering on maps, have a lot of clients that have geodata. And so we, we sort of did a survey and of course the predominant system out there is PostGIS. And so we basically uh, followed the blueprint that they laid and I think there's a standards committee behind them too or a group that tries to set some standards. Um, so right now we support point, line string, polygon, and multi-polygon types. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm, you know, you may not be familiar with um, this data, but basically it's any kind of geometry uh, and possibly with geographical context. So what I, mean, what I mean by that is for a point, you might have a XY, you know, Cartesian coordinate, or you might have XY, which is a longitude latitude uh, in like Mercator space or WGS84 in actual degrees. Um, and typically the, these are represented um, on the right side of this chart as a, as a WKT string. So it's sort of a standard string literal format. Um, all right, so in our system, geotypes are first class types, but they're actually type containers. So we don't really have a, a sort of lower level geotype. Um, and I, you know, I think that this is kind of an interesting design decision and gets into some of the uh, ways in which we can really accelerate these queries. Um, so what I mean by that is, for example, a point is really just a type container that has underneath of it an array. And we st actually um, support uh, compression. Um, so we can take a, a set of doubles and put them in basically a byte array. So that's why the type is tiny int. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's based on the longitude latitude range. So it's only if your coordinates are in degrees. Um, but you know, for points and line strings, we actually have um, these underlying containers, these K array containers. And this is nice because uh, is, you know, basically after we teach a module of our system about the geotypes, we can use all the other code uh, for these these you know fundamental what we call physical types. So to give you like a concrete example, if you pass in line string to our code gen, we're going to see that and we're going to say, okay, line string is actually two arrays, and so we're going to be able to just call the existing code gen functions on the arrays, and we don't really have to uh, mess with the you know fundamental parts of the system. I mean, isn't that how PostGIS works as well? Uh, yeah, I actually. So I was thinking about that. Um, yeah. It's actually more farther from the middle, right? 
It's not uncommon to have sensors. No, no, I don't think, yes, yeah, so I want to be clear that I don't think this is a novel design, but I think that this shows off um, some, this, that our system works really well with this design. Um, and I actually, I, I was thinking about that when I wrote these slides because I joined this project after the design phase and when we were sort of grappling with this design decision at very low levels in the system. And, um, uh, you know, I, there are some, some interesting aspects, especially when it comes to the institute rendering. Um, so uh, Todd sort of alluded to this, but um, we're super, super careful with GPU memory. And so if you pass in a query like the first query here, uh, select MapDGO with no filters, then we're just going to pull that data into CPU and send it right back to the user. Um, and so we, we refer to this in the system as, as a lazy fetch, basically. Those, those, that MapDGO column, those underlying physical columns never hit the GPU. For the second query, where we actually have a filter on MapDGO, we're actually hitting the GPU, and so we'll actually pull in um, those, those physical columns. Now, this is super nice for rendering um, because we can put... Um, okay, so here's, a, here's an example of just... Uh, the non-lazy fetch, and you can see um, we have a MapDQL command line utility. It's just a way to interact with the system, and it'll dump memory info. And so you can see here that um, we have basically the three, so this is a multi-polygon, so it's got three underlying uh, arrays, and you can see each array is represented there in GPU memory. Okay, so where this is really nice is for rendering. And so imagine that you have like 11 billion rows of multi-polygons, and you want to render all of the multi-polygons in a specific region we can pull just the bounds. So whenever we ingest a polygon, we actually compute a bounding box and store that as an initial physical column. And the reason we do that is so that we can pull just that physical column uh, to GPU memory, do the filter on that physical column, and then we can go and pull the appropriate fragments uh, that are not included in the filter as a sort of a second phase or potentially a non-institute phase depending on other parts of the query. Um, and so for this example, you know, we're projecting out this MapDGO column but we're only pulling the bounds column to, to GPU. And actually, if you, if you follow the uh, number in red, you'll see that this, the, the um, uh, column index is actually is, is eight, where on the previous slide it was five, six, and seven. So this is yet a different column as far as the system's concerned. Um, and so this is basically a, a sort of summary. And, and where we'd like to take this is with 3D and time series and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, with 3D, we're probably not going to have an initial column for Z. But for time series, it might be interesting to have an additional column for Z because you might want to filter on time first and not have to bring all the cores to the GPU. Um, we have a couple clients that have like uh, like 500,000 cores in a single polygon or a single multi-polygon, which can actually be multiple uh, polygons, but it's still uh, pretty big. Um, yeah, so uh, this is sort of a repeat of what I said uh, before, but we also leverage existing support for like data load and null checking, et cetera. So we don't have to like handle geo nulls separately than arrays. Um, and you'll see in our system in a lot of places, uh, if you were actually to go look through the code, that will do like an is geometry check and then we'll recursively call the same function that was called just with a sort of synthesized arguments based on what columns make up that geometry. Okay. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about how we handle um, uh, geotypes at sort of the parser and translator level. Um, and uh, so, well, that might have been out of order. Um, uh, I guess not. Anyway, um, so one thing that's nice about, um, let me just skip to here. Okay, so, uh, our parser is Apache Calcite, and we actually use it as both a parser and an optimizer. So we send the query into Calcite um, for uh, you know, basically all of our queries. I think it's DDL that doesn't go through Calcite uh, right now. But all of our other queries go through Calcite, and we get back an RA tree. Um, and so we go through and deserialize the RA tree, um, and then we'll run it through our interpreter and our translator, and, and we'll end up with these uh, analyzer nodes which tell our system you know, what to work on. And so uh, if we follow this example of ST contains, which is a common uh, PostJS operator and is what most of our clients want to use, um, when that goes through Calcite, so Calcite actually added geospatial capability after we had added ours. Um, and so we're not actually using any of theirs, though we have, we have started to look into whether that's going to be feasible. But Calcite just sees ST contains as, a, as an extension function. Um, and they, it actually sees this poly and point columns as being of type any. So it doesn't even know any type information. So it just makes sure that ST contains has two arguments and it knows that it's going to return a bool 
and it'll um, drop that through the RA tree. So when we hit SD contains in our interpreter, we're actually going to go and start to replace that with some geospecific information. Um, and so the interpreter is really just going to say, oh, okay, so this point is a, you know, this is actually referencing a certain column in the catalog that's a point column, and this uh, polygon is referencing a polygon column. Um, and it's not going to be until we hit the translator where we, where we unify all this information and convert from relational algebra to these work units that we're actually going to go and convert ST contains uh, from this sort of like calcite point polygon function to this actual, uh, what basically mimics the C++ code. And so at the bottom of the screen there, you'll see the ST contains after we've really gone through and translated it. And this is actually replacing these, um, these type containers with, uh, with their actual physical types. So you have for the polys, you have the pointer and the size, and you'll actually have a bunch of other arrays for the polys. And then for the point, you've got, again, pointer size. And then you actually have uh, compression information and some other metadata. Um, and so, you know, the interpreter translator makes this actually really easy for us. And it's a part of the system that I only really got to know recently. Um, but it's, it's really, you can do some interesting stuff. Um, and we've been like modifying our uh, binary operator node to sort of add a overlaps node, which we can create as, you know, a greater than, less than, uh, and uh, operation. Um, the other thing that we do in the translator that I think is worth mentioning is we'll take a certain, or in the interpreter, um, we'll take certain operations like a filter and a group by, and we'll actually coalesce them uh, into a single relational algebra node, and that, that ends up being a single work unit for us. And the reason that this is important is we don't want to make two passes over over data if we can apply the filter and do the grouping at the same time, um, you know, it's, it's much better in our system. Um, let me just go back to, the, um, to actually using the geospatial types. So as Todd sort of mentioned, we have um, a, a user-defined functions framework or an extensions functions framework. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a UDF framework yet. Uh, we're working on getting it to be, to be there. SDF, yeah, software-defined. Um, but basically, uh, we have these extension functions where you can write C++ code that operates on, on these physical columns. And so this, this ST endpoints um, is a very simple function. It just tells you how many points are in your chords array. But you can see the definition there kind of matches where you have this pointer size and then a compression parameter. Um, and so you can go and write these. They'll get compiled both with whatever compiler uh, you're using for your C code and then also with NBCC. And then they'll get inlined into the kernel. Um, and so it's, it's really, you know, we're talking about uh, user-defined functions and maybe supporting Julia and all these other languages, but it's really nice in that you can sit down and write C++ code in these files, um, and Calcite will actually uh, pick up a simple one for you. So if you just have like a, a function that outputs a double and takes in a double or something like that, Calcite will handle uh, will handle the translating everything for you. You just drop that function in. What am I doing on time? <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah. So the last thing. Um, I know that, that was super fast, uh, but the last thing I wanted to sort of get to was uh, some ongoing work. So when we launched our, um, our initial geo framework, um, our, our you know, ST contains and ST distance were basically the only you know, sort of useful for analytics functions we had. Um, and that's because it, it's a lot of work to get all the other parts of the system right. Uh, and now that you know, it's been out in the wild and we've gotten some feedback from customers, um, you know, we're looking at, at actually doing you know, interesting stuff with this. Um, so, you know, SD contains is, is uh, I, always get the, I always have to look at the Postgres website to get the order right, but, um, or the Post.js website, but it's basically, uh, uh, it's saying, is the point in the polygon in this example? Um, so I, I have, you know, some of the schema here and how you would write the query and sort of a diagram that shows a couple of polygons and a couple of points, three polygons, three points, and we just want to do a very, you know, it's basically a, an equijoin operator is, am I in a polygon? And you wouldn't believe how many companies from retail to uh, like connected car telematics uh, to oil and gas want this capability. What census block are you in? Yeah, are you census blocks, zip blocks codes. Um, so right now we're using a loop join, um, which is pretty rough. Though it's actually, you know, we have all these CUDA cores. We get decent performance and a lot of clients have benchmarked us. Uh, we had one client benchmark us against Spark and post GIS, and you know, we were able to finish some queries that those systems weren't able to. The flip side of that when benchmark, indexed, right? when, when those systems were indexed, we're yeah. And um, we're, yeah, doing an N squared loop joint, exactly. Really um, the flip side is that this is, you know, hours and not, you know, milliseconds, which is kind of our sweet spot and, and what our clients expect. So 
uh, we're basically looking at adding uh, ST contains to our hash joint infrastructure. And so right now we have um, uh, an open addressing. We use a murmur hash for our hash join. Um, and we basically go through and um, uh, we, we have a ba basically a, a one to one and one to many what we call baseline hash, which is the open ha addressing scheme. And then we have a perfect hash um, if you've got, you know, sort of trivial like uh, our dictionary encoded strings are typically pretty easy to just perfect hash because you'll get like zero to a thousand and, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, so the idea here is to basically take the inner table, the polygon table, and to uh, chop up the, rec the, the square into uh, basically evenly sized grids. Um, and so we'll go through each grid and we'll uh, generate for each grid, just give it a, basically an a, a ID in the hash table. Um, and for our probe phase, for each point, we'll compute what grid that point is in just by taking the floor. We'll say it's the lower left corner. Uh, and we'll hash that as well. And so we basically are treating this problem as a generalized octree. Um, and the reason that we can do this is our hash infrastructure supports these sort of coalesced keys. So we can have up to eight sort of coalesced key components in a single hash. Um, and so this is like ongoing work uh, that, that you know, we're still scoping out. But we're hoping that we can really accelerate uh, the SD contains performance and then you know, extend this to a 3D quad tree or n-dimensional uh, 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 data with you know point ZM. Even time series joints, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Would this be you and the GPU to do this? Um, so we would do the so we actually do build hash tables on GPU, um, and then the the you know uh, probe takes place on the GPU. Right. Um, you, build, we, you build build a hash table on the GPU and then ship it back up to the CPU and then do what you're probing on that up there. No, we probe on the GPU. All right. Um, we, we will conditionally build the hash table on GPU. I'd have to go uh, look at that code again to get you the exact conditions, but it's all in you know, the open source repo. Um, admittedly, could use some more uh, organization, but. Okay. Yeah. The very cool thing about a GPU is that a lot of people keep statistics. Sorry to interrupt, but a lot of people keep statistics in their database to kind of know what's a cardinality estimation, what are the parameters I should use in my hash today. Uh, with NatD or with GPUs, we can just simply table scan 10 billion records in 20 milliseconds. We'll often do that, and then we have very precise Instagramming and cardinality estimates that we can use for our kind of hash bucket parameters. One advantage is just having a lot of that. Um, yeah, so yeah, so we're uh, you know hoping that that this work will land shortly and we'll be able to sort of uh, you know improve on this for other types. The other thing too is like um, you know the, the fundamental idea here is is that we're basically looking at an overlaps operation. So we're trying to see uh, do two ranges because because you can imagine extending ST contains to is this line string in a polygon where you'd actually have multiple bins you'd have to probe. Um, but uh, you know the the sort of overarching ideas overlaps, which we're seeing for time series customers, geo customers, uh, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so that's pretty much all I have. Uh, happy to take any questions on anything I covered, or just any general system questions. Um, I don't know. Did you have any more, Todd? Or are you? No. Okay. I can just take any questions you guys have. Let's thank the speakers. Two questions. Yes, sir. Can MapD take advantage of the smaller insights that are available on the tensor centric GPUs like Unit 4 or Unit 8, or are those just not uh, enough to store what, what you care about? We have N8, we have small ints. Yeah. I think our small type right now is a, is a byte. Well, we end up having to align, you know, we end up having to, so right now we don't. Um, we have some, uh, so I was going to say we don't actually take the GPU model into account, but that's or the compute uh, capability into account, but that's not entirely true. We have some features where we will enable or disable or change things based on whether you're Maxwell or Kepler or whatnot. Um, I think right now, based on our alignments, um, we sort of just choose to align everything to to eight bytes or four bytes or whatever is you know most appropriate given the the query. Sorry, but eight, uh, sorry, I should clarify. We do have. In eight small n, it is one byte. It is byte aligned. Like we don't pad it, right? 
<laughs> we did get. Yeah. Okay. Pretty. So we there is bytes. Yeah, I mean, we definitely so have that. One byte, two byte, and then four byte and eight byte, right? And we don't do any sub byte stuff at the moment. We may in the future, but I don't think we. I think you have to explicitly take advantage of these these features, um, like the yeah, tensor cores and stuff, right? You have to be doing a particular type of matrix multiplication under the moon on the third week of the month. And, uh, you know, we don't do that yet. I'm not saying we couldn't in the, uh, in the future, uh, for example. We yeah, we don't, we don't pad anything in storage. But I think in the output buffers, depending on what you're doing, oh, we might pad in the output buffer. The input buffer. Yeah, and then in the storage, the then it would be. Us. But I, I don't know if we would take advantage of, um, of the yeah, int date instructions yet. Yeah. We do stuff with like shared memory, like um, the cool thing after uh, after Kepler, which is now pretty old. Uh, Nvidia did a lot of good stuff with shared memory, so we do all this stuff around group by, like where if the group by will fit in shared memory, which is what sixty four kilobytes per SM. So you can actually have a few thousand groups, and we can use uh, shared memory, which is almost as fast as L1 cache. And those queries are basically read down, which is pretty awesome. But then bigger stuff has to use global memory, of course. All right, let's thank the speakers one last time. Let's take a trip through the far side and black suits troops the group on the store. And the uncivilized island of New York where the criminals run the project, development to drug spots. I be sleeping through the screens and rapid fire shots. My block consists of multiple juvenile offenders and their crews. I'm telling you, even precincts get dead zone. These kids make it fix, peep this. Operation safe home ain't shit. Giuliani got these perpetrating housing cops on the dicks. Now ain't this a bit?